just in case anybody besides us looks at this, will sure. you say and spell your name for me and give me your title, please? Sure, I'm General Gus Perna, uh, P-E-R-N-A. I'm the commander of Army Materiel Command. For people who are not familiar with the Army, what are you in charge of? So I am one of four Army commands, uh, uh, generally responsible for the sustainment and logistics uh, and material readiness uh, for the Army. So I do logistics uh, and then uh, equipment material readiness. And Kim said you had some opening thoughts that you wanted sure. to Sure. Uh, so one, th thanks for doing this with me. Um, it's uh, been a journey. Uh, I'll bring us back almost a year now, right, when, um, when uh, this issue really came, you know, out in the open. Uh, reminder that Secretary Esper, currently then the Secretary of the Army, uh, and General Milley, the current chief at the time, took responsibility for the housing issue. Uh, there was no pointing, no pacification of the sincerity of things or the seriousness of things. It was about, hey, this is our responsibility and we're taking responsibility. I was very proud of that. That's why I wanted to open up with that because I, I was proud to be a soldier that day. Uh, uh, the second thing, uh, maybe not the exact second, but very close is they appointed me, a four-star general uh, responsible for all the installations and housing. Uh, and I was given very specified guidance. Uh, we're gonna fix the problem. We're gonna take responsibility and we're gonna fix. We are going to provide quality and safe homes for our soldiers, our families, and our civilians. Uh, and we are gonna restore their confidence in us. Uh, and then we're gonna ensure that we have a plan to get our installations where we want them uh, over the next 50 years. We're going to lead. We are not going to be led. Uh, very clear guidance, uh, and we've been executing off of that guidance since. Uh, clearly, uh, Honorable McCarthy and General McConville have taken over. Guidance is the same, uh, exactly the same. Zero, zero difference between the leaders. So it makes it easy for me. So I just wanted to pass that to you, uh, put things in perspective from where I stand. Um, uh, I recently had somebody ask me, hey, aren't you, aren't you sorry that uh, you've been given this mission? Or, you know, can you believe they, they gave this mission to you with all those other things you're doing? Uh, and my response, my response was, hey, I'm glad I got it. This is a command, this is commander's business. We are responsible for our soldiers and families and uh, we can get this right. So I thought it was a great thing to happen. That guidance that you were given, those are some lofty goals. Right. Where do you think you are in terms of meeting them at this point? Okay, so first things first was taking responsibility um, and fixing the near-term problems, right? What we wanted to make sure is that none of our families uh, were in danger. Life, health, safety, immediate reaction to that. So anything we thought uh, that might cause illness uh, or extended beyond that, we went after immediately. Uh, so what did we do? We took all of our homes, 87,000 homes, another 13,000 government homes, and 6,700 barracks, and we immediately created what we call a common operating picture. We laid it out across all of our installations, 60 installations, and we started tracking all the eaches, every single work order on every single installation. And then we highlighted them, the difference between a common work order, light switch doesn't work, doorknob needs tightening, et cetera, versus mold that might have an impact on a family, flooding, hot water heater bursts and there's flooding, life, health, safety. So we track those uh, in specific detail. The life, health, and safety ones are, are immediately executed in 24 hours, and we send quality assurance people to check. I hired 114 people, put them throughout the installations to go check the checker, right? That's how important that was. We took the other work orders, we managed them because we're trying to figure out patterns so that we can do preventive maintenance, get ahead of things like you would do in your home. Uh, and then we only check 5% of those, right? door not right, et cetera, so that I can manage the people to the crisis. So that was step number one. Um, we, we set up a 24-7 uh, hotline uh, where residents could call us and we answer that and we check those. Uh, and then we uh, set up uh, battle rhythm presentations so that commanders are briefing commanders, right? It's not the partner 
working something and we don't know what's going on. Commanders are briefing commanders on these. So I get the briefing from Colonel, two-star general, three-star general, and they're briefing me on all the situations so that we are holding ourselves accountable to that. If I may, I'm sorry. How do you manage the relationship between the Army and the private companies? So, um, look, uh, first of all, just if, in case you're not going to ask me, I'm an advocate of the private companies being a part of this. Um, they have come in and they've given the Army some uh, great capability, a capacity that, in my opinion, we couldn't have done by ourselves. Right? We added, uh, there's 87,136 homes, I think, um, uh, that we have that they're involved in. Of that number, only 12,000 have not been touched. So we've either built new, we modernized, um, uh, all the rest of them. So 71,000, quick math, uh, have been done by the partners, right? This is a big deal. If they didn't do this, then we'd have to take money that's given to us for training or something else, modernization of equipment, and put it into the housing. So th that's why this is so important. Now, with that said, they need to be held accountable. They're like an industry partner who does a service for us um, out on the battlefield or producing a tank, a Bradley, a striker vehicle. They need to be held accountable. This is where we weren't doing so well. Uh, and we, the chief uh, at the time, General Milley, said we will hold them accountable. So what did I do to that end? Garrison commanders, here are your instructions. Here's how you're going to relate with the partners. Senior commanders, here's how you're going to relate with the partners, right? Uh, and same with the income commander. All the way up to me, right? Every month, the seven senior, uh, are, the seven partners, the CEOs are briefing me, right? It's a battle rhythm event. Uh, we do it telephonically. Uh, it's a routine thing, so it, it happens, doesn't get canceled, and I get briefed. And I tell them what I assess of their portfolios, right? It's not being handled down here, it's being handled up here. So I think this has come a long way. It's not, it's not perfect yet. Uh, we're still working through some translation of responsibilities, my words. Uh, but at the end of the day, when the two senior leaders are talking, usually people do what we say. Uh, and it's gone a long way for us. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that, that line of thinking, because when you're watching these congressional hearings, you're hearing from the companies, you're hearing from the secretaries of the branches, there's an, almost an apologetic tone. Uh, we are sorry this is happening and we are working to fix it. Mm -hmm. But the families who we talk to on the ground say that they are getting a different tone and that the relationship that they experience with the private companies and sometimes with the folks in the garrison mm -hmm. is difficult. How do you balance that? How do you fix that? Yeah, so remember my number two piece of guidance was about restoring confidence with our families. One family or 87,000 families, it doesn't matter to me. One family is not being treated right. One family is not in a home that's uh, quality and safe. It, it, that's all I'm worried about, right? Uh, and so that's our tone, my tone through the chain of command to them. Now, it's 60 installations, it's 87,000 homes. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to get out and see all those uh, and reinforce what I just said to you. Uh, we're building momentum on that. It's a change. It's a change of culture. Uh, there was a time where before, uh, you know, the situation occurred, commanders were told, it's not your responsibility to interact with the partners, right? And then we flipped the switch on them. So what did we do? We, re -cha we changed the training that we're giving our commanders both the garrison commanders and the senior commanders. So we restructured their training. We've implemented battle rhythm, where general officers are sitting at the end of the table. We implemented town halls, mandatory town halls, where general officers are there, not just colonels, not just partners. Um, we, we're doing the events that I'm at, you know, getting feedback from, so I can start pushing back down. Uh, every installation I go to, or one of the generals that work for me go to, they have a mandatory stop with garrison and we go to homes. Secretary and the chief are visiting homes. Uh, and so we're trying to kind of do our best to um, spread ourselves out and hear everybody. There's people on my phone list uh, in particular right now. There's 
two families on my personal phone list that I'm talking to, right? Because it's, it's, um, their complaints have bubbled up uh, and we haven't been able to solve them, so now I'm involved. So I personally dial the phone, they answer, and they talk with me, uh, not 10 layers of people. Uh, now, you know the deal, 87,000 homes, could I do that? No. Uh, and unfortunately, we have two that are bubbling up to me, but it's important that we take care of them. So we're working them by eaches. We're trying to convert all of them uh, to regain confidence, uh, but it's not gonna happen all overnight. Because of the way these contracts are structured, the companies have a lot, if not all, of the power. So how do you keep families safe? Oh, I, I feel very empowered. <laughs> I feel incredibly empowered to make sure that that happens, right? And the secretary uh, and the chief have given me this authority. Uh, and trust me when I tell you, when I pick up the phone and talk to them, they're moving out to that end state. I do not feel uh, uh, constrained one bit to get things right. Uh, and I have, a, I have a saying, you don't have to own it to control it. I feel I can influence quite a bit. Do you feel that your leaders on the ground and the company staff on the ground understands that? I think they're learning every day what that means. Uh, and I think the culture is shifting. Uh, and, and it is, I believe that with all my heart. I believe some uh, partners had stronger leadership uh, chain of command, where uh, they were able to guard, or, or they were able to influence train. Uh, excuse me, they were able to influence change quicker, right? Because of the way they were structured, and there's some uh, that are structured differently, and that's what we're working our way through. A developer, a partner who has a sub that's you know managing the installation, right? That's where we're having a little bit of difficulty. I deal with the partner. Partner says, well, that's my sub. I said, that's your problem. I want this, right? And then they go do it, right? And so uh, we're, we're getting there. We're not there yet. I, I, would, I would not dare tell you that. On, I'm glad you brought up the subcontractors. Um, on a base in Virginia, here in Virginia, Fort Belvoir, mm -hmm. um, some of the families tell us that there is a contractor that's still working there that continually is not doing remediation properly. And mm. so there are continuous instances in individual homes where mold just keeps returning. Sure. Why are those contractors still there? Okay, so what we're doing, we have to work through uh, the process on every one of them. My number one responsibility is the health and welfare of those families. I personally have walked those houses where these have been brought to my attention. One of my two phone calls is because of um, their belief that this is not happening. So when I went and walked through the house, you're right, it was not happening. I addressed it with the partner uh, and the partner takes corrective action with the subcontractor. Uh, if, if we identify legal, ethical, or moral, then it's immediate elimination, right? If it's a poor standard, then we go through processes of uh, how to get it to the right place. Uh, and we're working and we're growing our way through that. Uh, I would tell you, my I'm learning quite a bit myself, but we have to figure out what right is. So I, I, didn't, I, I grew up how to uh, prepare an army for war and how to go to war. You know what I've learned in the last year about developing, you know, how to build a development, housing development, how to take care of the housing development? More than I ever wanted to know. Um, so, all right, there's mold. Where did the mold come from? Is there, is there a, a leak? And if the leak is there, how do we solve the leak? Then how do we remediate? What level are we remediating to? Who gets the authority to call that, right? Is, is it somebody that walks in and says, I don't see mold? Or is it somebody that comes in with test equipment and determines it right? Uh, truth in lending, we've had some companies that do this, did this very well. They took responsibility immediately. They went in and identified the problem of the leak. They went in and identified how they were going to remediate. They brought in third party, uh, and they did just a magnificent job, right? Some companies are learning not a little bit harder. But we are staying on them and holding them accountable. Uh, and that's where I'm at with that. When do you see a for when do you foresee a time? when no military family will have to deal with mold in their base housing? Very near future, in relative terms. 
okay? Because, you know, a house today, I'll just give you an example. I own a home, right? Um, and uh, the home is 10 years old, right? It's, it's not on base. It's some place where my wife and I are going to retire, right, eventually. So the house is 10 years old. We happened to be uh, visiting it this past summer, had a leak, right, from the chimney down through the ceiling. I just woke up. I happened to see the water in the bedroom. Well, that, for 10 years, that hadn't been there. And now all of a sudden it's there, right? Because a storm had hit, the chimney had shifted, water's coming down a different way, and I got lucky. I saw the water, right? But what if you don't see the water? What if the water is contained and you never observe it? Well, what happens when that happens? Then you get mold and you don't, there's no way. So I can't promise that we're at end state, but we're working the preventive maintenance to get ahead of that, to go do the checks, uh, and then we're, we're, we're driving ourselves to solve the problems when identified, eliminate the leak, do the remediation, etc. Uh, but I feel good that we are gaining ground quickly on this. Um, personal opinion, I don't believe that it's a, um, um, I believe there were situations in homes where water had access, right, which caused the mold in this particular problem, right? Uh, which is, is a life, health, and safety for me. And so we're attacking that. I would also tell you, though, uh, that's not my big problem. My big problem is plumbing. Uh, and it's associated with the 12,000 homes I told you that is that has not been touched yet. They're old homes. They're pre-1970 homes. And so plumbing is having trouble 50 years later, right? And so that's really my big problem. Mold is not my big problem right now. I'd like to show you some documents. Um, so this is from the most recent revision of the Resident Responsibility Guide on Fort Belvoir. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned a change in culture. One of these paragraphs says, family housing on Fort Belvoir is provided as a privilege to military members and their families. A landlord is not obligated to provide housing to any service member. I'll let you take a look at that. Well, that's I can't read that. Can't. I don't have my glasses. Okay. Well, that's what it says. Mm -hmm. um, well, that is the case. Is that really the tone? No, absolutely not. So I, I, I'm not familiar with that document that you just read to me, but I'll be glad to take it and look at it. But uh, that is absolutely 100% not the tone, right? We are an organization, the Department of Defense, we have soldiers, uh, families, and civilians that are responsible at the end of the day to prepare for war and go to war. We want to make sure that our families are in secure installations and that they're living in the best uh, quality homes that are safe uh, and that families are happy to raise their children in. That is uh, our standard. Over. Um, I know you can't read it. <laughs> One of the Sorry other. about that. That's okay. One of the other um, pages that uh, residents, that families have told us they're concerned about is that it says resident will, will obtain permission from landlord before installing any additional security devices. So if a family wants to put a security camera on the inside of their home mm -hmm. for their safety, they have to ask permission to, to do that yeah. first. Do you think that's okay? Uh, no, I don't. But, uh, but here's what I would really would, you know, uh, you know, as we're talking, right, and people are watching. What I need is have, have families bring this up to us through their change of command, through the advocacy groups, through the garrison commander, right? Uh, and then guess what? Then leaders can step in and be involved and get us to solutions uh, versus, you know, you hand me a document during an interview. Well, I'm glad you brought that up um, because one of the residents' advocacy groups on Fort Belvoir sure. Um, said that they have had a conversation with Army personnel, mm -hmm. not, um, this particular conversation was not with um, the private companies, um, and they were told that the thought process, and I've heard a recording of this conversation, mm -hmm. um, but they were told that the thought process is that these families don't want to leave the hotels and go back to their homes because they want to collect the reimbursed mm -hmm. BAH and that they're in it for the money. Is that the right perspective so to have? My responsibility and the position of the United States Army from Secretary and the Chief is to make sure we have safe, quality homes. That's all I think about, 
right? And so my responsibility is to make sure the partners are adhering to that and that we're executing to that standard. Uh, and then I get families in their homes and that's where my thought is. That's my guidance down through my chain of command that I'm holding everybody accountable to. Uniform and partner. That's what I believe with all my heart. Laura, you've got about two to three minutes left. Okay, thanks. Um, so where do we go from here? Because there are families who are still living with mold. There are sure. families who are still living with plumbing issues. There are mm -hmm. families who are still displaced. Where do we go from here to get to a point where all families, like you said, are in safe and quality homes? Sure, great question. So um, uh, the immediacy of the things we, we went after to fix. Uh, so here's the good news, right? It's, it's good news with, um, th that, that impacts families right now. Uh, on Monday at 1500 hours, every Monday, I get a personal rundown of every single family that's displaced. We start uh, by installation and we go over every name. On Monday, there was 96 people displaced, 96 families. My conversation is, that's dogs that don't know what rooms are in, that's children that are sleeping in rooms that are, you know, not their bedrooms and doing their homework, that's mothers who can't cook meals in their uh, kitchens, right? Uh, so I want to track those, I want to make sure we're getting the problem solved, and I want to get them back into their homes, right? So that they can go about their life, right? Life, is, life has got its own challenges, right? Uh, raising children, uh, professions on both spouse and um, uh, the soldier or uh, sailor or marine, airman. Uh, so we want to get normalcy back there, but we want it first and foremost, safe, quality repair, period, Have right? So. So I do those, right? That, that, that's, that's a big deal. Um, of those, though, what we're finding is out of the 87,000 homes that I'm monitoring, right, that are RCI partners, um, we are down below 100. Uh, but what I'm finding is about 15 to 30 of those homes, right, people move back in, and then I get 15 to 30 new ones, right, for different reasons, not not just uh, mold or whatever, right? So hot water heater breaks. Hot water heater could break in your house today. What would you do, right? Uh, and so uh, because I'm monitoring all those, that's why it seems like uh, it's a problem. Here's the deal. One is too many. We want zero. So what we're doing is we're implementing the preventive maintenance procedures. Uh, partners are briefing how they're doing that. Uh, we have asked, uh, we've changed the incentive fees, right? So uh, families get a big vote, you know, you know, what they think. Maintenance response time, quality of work, big, big, uh, big things. Uh, they come to me now. They used to go up into the building. Used to go from colonel up into the Pentagon. They go from colonel to general to me now. And I assess and I approve. So that's accountability there. Uh, we're also, just recently, last week, we started, I was able to finally get to a place where w we were doing uh, the small things right, now I'm at the bigger things. So I brought every garrison commander uh, in, right, all 60 of them, we brought the partners in, and we went over their plans to fix the housing uh, from now all the way through their 50 years. Uh, and so what I know now is, when was the renovation, or when was the new homes built? When was the renovations done? How many more homes do we have to do? What is the plan? How are we working the reinvestment dollars? How we prioritized it? We hadn't done that before, at least in my tenure. Now we have that. So, attack the symptoms, right? Get it right, standards, work orders, quality, quality checks, accountability and time, et cetera, incentive fees, Right? And now we're at the bigger thing. How do we change the installations to make sure they're there where we want them at the end? Before you go, I just have one final question for you. Um, all of that sounds great. And I wish there were families that were sitting here who call us, who I could sit here and listen to that. How do you get it to a point where what you're saying is what the families in these homes feel? Yeah, so no, that's a fair question. Uh, and it's not gonna happen overnight. And in a, in a time period, a year is a long time. But this didn't happen in one year, right? This happened over numerous years. Uh, and so what we have to do, 
as a, you know, as I laid out, right? We're fixing the life, health, safety immediately to quality. We are working on building the trust with families, right? Um, we, we're spending a lot of time trying to get them to know what we're doing, right? As we travel, knock on doors, etc., town halls, uh, feedback loops through Facebook, uh, emails, etc. But it's not going to happen overnight. We have to continually build uh, their trust and confidence in us. Uh, and we'll gain a lot of ground, and one incident will lose a lot of ground. So it's going to take leadership. The Secretary and the Chief are clear on that. We are responsible, and we're going to lead our way through this. We are not going to abdicate our responsibility to the partners. We, the United States Army, are going to be in charge and hold ourselves accountable. Well, I will tell you that the families that we talk to, like, they do mention your name. Mm. They say, you know, General Perno was on our base, and, like, we loved what he had to say. I think their hesitance from their conversations with me is making sure that when you're not there and you're not drilling it in. No, that's fair. That those people who are there who are supposed to be their advocates and look out for them and these private companies are continuing to follow through on everything that you say. Okay, so two, two points to that end, mm -hmm. right? Look me right in the eye. Mm -hmm. One, my son is a lieutenant married to a beautiful, my beautiful daughter-in-law who was the daughter of a master sergeant. They have three girls, 11, seven, and one. Every day I do this housing thing, I think about those three girls, every day. It's not about the housing I grew up in. It's about what do they have to live in and what is the future for them? That's number one. So when I take that thought process, then it's not about my metrics. It's not about the headlines. It's not about the one story. It is about what problems am I solving, right? Now, you're right, it is me. I solve problems. I put routines in place. I hold people accountable. There's standards. Everybody knows them, <laughs> right? And uh, they hear about it when it's not right, right? And so what I'm doing is, and it takes time, doesn't happen because we declare it, right? The last time, well, I won't get into that. <laughs> But it, it just takes time. And so we're, we're setting up the processes. I'm out being visible. I'm sending generals out. I, even on this base right here, right before I met with you, I'm walking barracks, right? Now, you don't, you're not really asking me about barracks. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time thinking about barracks, right? Because my son, one of my sons was a private in the Air Force. So I think about what was he living in, right? If his mother were to see one of the rooms that I'm responsible for, I'd be in deep trouble. <laughs> so I'm trying to fix I, That's where I'm at. Does that make sense yeah. to you? So I think it's about personal. them. That's my, that's my motivation, those three girls. Who, oh, by the way, my son's a lieutenant. I don't know what your husband is. Is a lieutenant. So he's got 10, 15, 20 more years to go, mm -hmm. right? It's not just one day. And then I'm trying to establish, uh, hold people accountable, and solve the problems. So, so I know it's personal. You, just, you have to believe me, but... Yeah. That's where I'm at. You're convincing. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you hold me accountable. You go check the checker and call me. Right? You're just another piece of information for me. If, if families are coming to you because they trust that you're going to write their story, well, good. I'll hear it. That's why I'm here with you.